Hello, everyone. Today I get to speak with Scott Keen, who has made an interesting new chip that might be used to interface with the brain. And uh, I hope you enjoy what he has to say. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Of course. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you. Will you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Scott Keen. I'm a graduating PhD student at Stanford University in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. And my research focuses on utilizing semiconducting polymers for biological interfaces and mimicry. And you recently had an amazing accomplishment. Uh, yeah, so, tell us, go ahead. Of course. So recently, um, some of our work was published in Nature Materials, where we worked to um, take some artificial synaptic devices that we had developed over the past four or five years now, um, and really tried to utilize the, um, benef the biocompatibility of the polymers we're using to really interface it with biology. And we did this uh, using a unique way, uh, typically electrical signals have been used to record um, neuron activity, but because we're really trying to emulate a synapse, we really wanted to emulate this chemical functionality. And so we uh, used um, the detection of dopamine as a way to interact or interface our artificial devices with biological um, cells. Our nervous system is made up of a, like a long chain of neurons and these neurons uh, speak to each other at terminals or at ends called synapses. Yeah. And in the past, we've had devices like uh, cochlear implants or pacemakers. And what these devices do is they stimulate the local region with electricity. Mm -hmm. But what you're doing is emulating the chemical processes of the synoptic connections. Your device then seems closer to our own biology than what our current neural stimulating devices are. Is that right? Yeah, that's generally the idea that um, we're, we're trying to approach this in a new way by taking chemicals as an input where traditional uh, recording devices use the electrical activity of the action potential as a way to read the activity of individual neurons or populations of neurons. Are you doing one-way communication or are you doing two-way communications with the cells? That is, is your device just taking signals from the cells or are you also sending signals into the cells? Uh, currently, we're only doing one-way communication. So we're detecting the activity of the cell. Uh, and without... what activity are you detecting? Uh, we're detecting the release of the neurotransmitter dopamine. Um, this. This neurotransmitter is uh, typically associated with long-term changes in brain connectivity. So the dopamine can act on many different types of receptors at that synaptic interface and change how strongly one neuron can communicate with the subsequent neuron through a conditioning or classical conditioning type of um, process. What type of cells are you using? Uh, so we're using PC12 cells. The, they are um, neuroendocrine models from a rat medulla. So um, they, they are very simple. They, they essentially secrete dopamine and don't do much else. So okay. it's very useful to um, <laughs> model how our device would interact with dopamine secreted from any neurological tissue. Did you say medulla? So these are rat brain cells and are they living on your chip? Yes, so they are um, commercially available, widely sold. So uh, we just order from the company and can uh -huh. culture them. And then uh, what we end up doing is culturing them on the surface of our devices. You've got somehow like a layer of nutrients for these cells to live. You've got somehow your own chemistry involved and then you've got electronics. and. How is that all smashed together in a way that doesn't kill the cell? Yeah, so we, um, we take our electronic devices, which are fabricated on silicon and um, using a perylene uh, organic coatings. And we add a, a, a collagen coating, which makes the surface a bit more um, welcoming to the cells. 
And then we put the cells in solution on top of the device and they naturally adhere to that huh. collagen coated surface. And then we keep everything within a microfluidic channel so that we have control over um, movement of nutrients and the chemical environment of the cells. How long do the cells live on the device? Uh, I think in our experiments, we've only really kept them on the device for one or two days. What's your long-term vision for this goal? Like what would happen in the end if you, if you achieve everything you're hoping to achieve and more, what would that be? Well, our next step is to see how this really interacts with dopaminergic pathways within the brain. So trying to develop a system which is implantable uh, rather than do this with cultured cells mm -hmm. just to get a better idea of what our system does. And eventually we would like to have this as a, a feedback into some signaling that return goes back to the cells such as chemical inputs that can modulate neural activity or other types of um, neuromodulation that you could think of. Uh, to what end? What, what would be the benefit to a human if they had this device and it worked? Well, so the, the main draw is that the device itself is performing, although albeit limited, uh, computation based on the input from the cells of that dopamine, dopamine release. And so what we'd like to do is utilize that small amount of computation to locally provide feedback rather than having to send signals in and out of the brain um, in order to control prosthetic devices um, oh. and treatments. So just to sort of avoid uh, this um, communication process that is quite difficult when you have to travel through the skull I understand that there are some devices that get implanted into brains. And I, I understand that Stanford recently had a project where this device got planted in human brains of quadriplegics. And so for the first time by thinking, they're able to um, control a mouse just, just with their thoughts. Mm -hmm. And the issue is that the communication with that device either has wires coming out or is complicated. And what you're thinking is that your device can be implanted into the, in the brain or adjacent to the brain and then locally control without having complicated signals coming in and out of the skull, for example. Essentially, yeah, that would be the long-term goal. We're very much inspired by these systems which can replicate and um, th these prosthetics which can allow quadriplegics to recover some of the functionality that they might be missing out on. Um, mm -hmm. And so we wanted to make something that's uh, maybe a little more com compatible with tissue. I believe these studies that you're referring to use silicon shanks as the recording electrodes, hmm. which tend to have limited stability uh, interfacing with tissue due to glial scarring, uh, sort of fouling that electrical connection. Wow, okay. So we hope that we can at least come up with new ideas to address these problems. Of course, we haven't really directly had any effect yet, but um, we hope that the, this new type of thinking can make some sort of impact somewhere, uh, maybe in replacing small parts of neural circuits with our artificial systems. How did you end up here? What what? sort of decisions did you make along the way that led to this achievement? Yeah, so we initially were trying to make devices which could accelerate uh, artificial neural network algorithms. So these are common machine learning algorithms that have become extremely popular in the last 10 years, I'd say. Uh, they're being used almost ubiquitously now for image recognition, speech recognition, uh, machine translation, and a lot of other amazing applications, but they're very computationally intensive. So we wanted to develop a device that could ease the, um, the energy and the power or, and latency required to train these systems. And we ended up using an organic material as 
because of its unique properties, it was well suited for this application. But we sort of hit a bottleneck where. So this was an accident. You're like your major, this major achievement, which is now featured in the news. This this was an accident. So um, not quite an accident. It was more that many people were hesitant that organic materials would be used in a computer and suggested organics are very compatible with bio biological systems. Why not try to target something in that space? Okay. And so we took their advice um, <laughs> and we wanted to sort of see where we could take that direction as well, considering that it was quite difficult to get, be taken seriously on the computation ends. So mm -hmm. um, we wanted to sort of explore the options that organics open up rather than sort of marry ourselves to this idea of we need to be in a computer chip. Scott, huge congratulations. Maybe after uh, it's working in a mouse or a rat, maybe we could talk about it again sometime. Yeah, who knows when that will be, but uh, very exciting, yes. But hopefully we can continue to make progress in this direction. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to meet you, Nick.